All right, so the the first task for today is to uh, discuss the topics and to assign people to topics. There is not everyone here, so I, I don't think we will finish that part, but at least for those of you who are here, then you we, we can do that. So what I did, I identified nine topics, uh, which are basically here. And then if you click on the ones which are not yet here, they will appear, right? So the all, not all the pages have been created. So there is a page created for SSI, which is just a placeholder page. Uh, but if you click on those and then go in, then you will see that it's like a placeholder page for who is responsible for the topic. And then I will post uh, some of the papers and some of the materials related to the topic. And then you will feel free to maintain that page yourself. The, I mean, the one who is responsible, right? So everyone will be kind of responsible for one topic. Uh, and then we will kind of work together to assign some of the papers and some of the uh, auxiliary materials for that topic. And then that person will give a presentation about that topic. And also, to, you know, at the end, they will prepare a report. Uh, the presentations, as I said on the first lecture, are not necessarily it can be but it doesn't necessarily need to be the results of your project like of your work it can be just kind of telling the class what that is and like teaching them about the topic right so you can do that in a form of a lecture that is about the topic but not about your research question or you can kind of deal with your research question and tell the, the class about the topic and what you did right so it's up to you uh ben what what the lectures yeah so we will have to uh, schedule that right so we will schedule the lectures and some of you for some of you the lecture will come earlier which you which means you will not be done with your work yet and for some of you it will come later and then you can talk about your work right um uh, because you know we we will spread it over time and you know we have um nine or ten topics so it was i think 10 of you in the course so that will take at least five weeks right so the the first two people will be kind of five weeks before they are the last two, two people right um so that's why that's what i'm saying that it will be kind of um uh a little bit up to you what you want to talk about so for some of the topics um it it like for example for G, gpt3 uh just talking about gpt3 is kind of enough right uh you don't need to do a lot of work to introduce it and to kind of tell what it is about and how it can be used and so on so some of the topics are kind of easier to talk about without doing work just learning about it and for some of the topics uh maybe there is a little bit of uh work needed right um so what we will do is we will have a table here with the dates and then we will kind of sign up of when you want to talk and then if you early then you may talk more generically if you later you can talk uh, more specifically about your work but even the people who are the last ones they can introduce the topic in a very generic way as well right so it's a little bit up to you uh how you want to do it if you want to do it about your work then maybe uh scheduling yourself towards the end is better because then you will have more, more work done right um so the first step is to decide who is doing what and then the second step is to decide the dates uh the dates uh we can um because we will have some uh some lectures which are predefined uh and we will do that with abilay uh and those lectures will come first such that all of you have more time to prepare uh, because even if you're doing kind of introduction to a topic, you still need a couple of weeks to prepare. So your lectures will come, you know, towards the second half of the of the semester anyway, right? Um, so we can do that like... Yeah, so the, the plan was uh, for having kind of a lecture format of about 45 minutes uh, plus some exercises, right? So you can talk less you can talk for example for 20 minutes but you can give the students some tasks or you can ask some questions or some do, make them do something and that will take some time so the whole time frame is about an hour 
but you don't have to be talking for an hour. You can be just talking for 20 minutes or you know, uh, 25 minutes uh, and then giving some exercises or giving some tasks and then the student will kind of do something. So the, the whole lecture is, yeah, about an hour. You can do more talking and less doing, or you can do more doing and less talking. So it's up to the person who is preparing the lecture, right? Okay, so that's the, that's the generic general logistics. Um, for the actual topics, uh, those are nine topics which are predefined, but it doesn't mean you don't, you cannot propose your own topic, right? So if you find that none of that topic really fits what you want to do and fits with your master topic or some other activities that you're doing, and you say, I would like to do this, then you propose your own topic instead. Uh, there was some people who were doing um, VR or gamifications uh, like Ben. I mean, Ben might choose the incentives maybe, uh, but if you don't like to do this incentive thing, then you can propose your own. Um, yeah, we can have a chat afterwards. Uh, so then you can propose your own topic and then do it in the same format as it is done here and then uh, make a page for it. And then we will kind of um, discuss and scope it. Um, some people might be interested in a slightly different topic than it's here, but close enough, then we can kind of shape it. That's why that, that second page is for defining what the topic really is, right? Um, uh, there was, um, yeah, you, you were interested in uh, SSI? Yeah, so for the SSI topics, uh, you can, because it's a very big topic, SSI itself is big, right? So what I thought is um, if you check the uh, diff foundational activities and pick kind of a one which is specific for the interest that you have, we can probably narrow down the topic to just one of those. Uh, those are already quite big topics. Uh, so each of them is quite a big topic in itself, right? And because we had generic introduction into uh, SSI uh, last semester, uh, this semester we can kind of dig deeper into particular, you know, particular specifics, uh, and each of them has a, a working group. So if you go to this uh, foundation, uh, they have quite a very well structured uh, approach, uh, and they have those uh, working groups. So each of that is a working group. And you can learn more, you can read the specifications, you can kind of dig deeper and you can actually join the group and start like uh, participating and like uh, seeing what they are, what they are doing. Um, we have, um, so we are, they have, uh, they have diff partners and we are collaborating with DIN. So DIN is the Nordics uh, identity initiative. Uh, which was initi initiated by Oslo company, uh, Divala, and we are working with Abile in a close collaboration with DIN. So we have a DIN repository on uh, GitHub, and we have kind of a, a very close collaboration uh, through, through DIN. Um, we were trying to do that from NTNU, but uh, there is kind of a chain of command, and it's kind of really <laughs> time consuming to get the signatures and approvals. Uh, so we are we're trying to have NTNU kind of listed here, same as uh, uh, Technical University Berlin and TNO from Netherlands. We want NTNU to be present, but yeah, that will take some time. So currently we're doing all the work through through DIN. Uh, yeah, so that's the the first the first topic. So I yeah. Yeah, yeah, we will have a lecture on your topic, yes. I mean, if, uh, you know, the, the preference is towards the list, but as I said, like, I, I am not super strict. And if, if the list doesn't fit your master project or your kind of interests, then you do what fits. And, and then we will listen to what fits, right? Yeah. 
I know, but that's I, I had those discussions with Christopher and, and he said, yeah, we, we kind of are flexible because we only have like uh, three specialization courses. And of course we cannot cover uh, 20 different master thesis topics, right? There will be people on the, on kind of outside of those co compartments, right? And my idea was just to have one specialization course, which has all possible uh, topics, but that doesn't work that well neither because then you cannot have those common lectures, right? Uh, and then people cannot learn a little bit more about those common things because then you just have a placeholder for all the individual specializations, right? Um, so we, it, it is kind of like a trade-off. So we have those three compartments and most things fit, fit in those three compartments, but some don't, and that's fine, right? Uh, then you do something in between, right? And especially we don't have this compartment for serious games and, and gamification anymore. We used to have, we kind of don't, and then people sit there, right? Uh, so that, that's perfectly fine. So you basically do a, a topic which you will work on as a lecturer, yeah. Any other questions? So far, no. So, so then, so the first one is quite clear. Uh, and the first one can, I'm, I'm happy if all of those topics is okay if more than one person takes, right? But if more than one person takes, let, let's say there are two people interested in GPT-3, right? It's kind of a hot uh, AI topic and people say, yeah, I want to do that. And if there are two people say, I want to do that one, then those two people cannot do the same thing. It cannot be just a review, general review of GPT-3 because uh, that, that doesn't make sense, right? So one person is enough to do the general review of G GPT-3. So if there are two people wanting to do GPT-3, then we have to define what each of them is doing, right? And it's a little bit hard uh, because uh, we would need to have this general overview of what it is, how it works, how you use it. And then the second thing is, you know, you would have to do some research with it. And because it's, you know, such a new technology and because um, may maybe it's possible, and I'm not saying that it's not, but like, for example, topic five is more suited for one person, right? But topic one, for example, it's easy to have five people working on it because you can dive into all those independent areas and kind of do a topic each, right? So some topics are kind of uh, fine with multiple people. Some topics are a little bit less fine with multiple people, but it's possible. So topic one, it's perfectly fine for multiple people. Uh, topic two is about mobile blockchains. Uh, there is a lot of hype and there is a lot of uh, misconceptions. And the idea here is that you have no cloud support. There is no central authority. There is no kind of a backend. It's just mobile, right? Uh, there is no uh, additional services that is offered uh, from outside because sometimes people say it's a, a mobile client for Bitcoin, right? And it's a mobile blockchain. Yeah, it's not really because the blockchain is something separate uh, and the mobile is only a client to the network, which is done by the PCs or by the cloud providers and by the miners, right? So this topic is not about uh, a mobile being a client. It's about mobile being the client and the server. There is no servers, it's just mobile, right? Uh, so for example, there is a interesting, uh, interesting work uh, which has been done in, in Hong Kong. I will put like, I was looking for it before the lecture and <laughs> there is no, uh, it's an empty space. Uh, I didn't fit that in. Um, they had a, a payment system for, um, for transportation, right? So uh, you have, uh, for example, in Norway, you, you, you have tickets and you buy uh, tickets for transportation uh, and you can have like a plastic card which you can prefill with money. And then when you go to the bus, you kind of uh, click some, some money out of the card and then you kind of uh, can travel, right? So those um, transportation payment systems, they are kind of uh, very popular and they sort of work um, historically, they worked in a form of you exchanging your, your fiat currency, your money, like Norwegian krona, for a piece of ticket or for a claim, right? And the claim, for example, allows you to travel one way or two ways uh, somewhere, right? But the, the claim is not money anymore. The claim is kind of like a claim for a service, right? So you have your real money, 
and then you're buying something that is a claim for a service, and then you can do fancy things with it if it's represented uh, digitally, right? If it's represented as a piece of paper, you can kind of uh, give it to your friend, and then your friend can go on a train, right? But if it's represented digitally, you can do more things with it. You can uh, trade it, you can do, um, for example, in, in, in Hong Kong, they had those uh, claims for the travel, but they also had kind of had a deal with the uh, takeaways and small restaurants in like train stations and so on, that they could accept the claims for travel as a money for, for food, right? So you could, for example, buy prefill your wallet with those credits for travel or for food, and then exchange it for food or for travel, right? You couldn't exchange it back to the normal money, right? So the, 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 that, you know, that doesn't work like that, right? Uh, yeah, if like in, in Norway, if for example, you bought a ticket and um, you can kind of cancel it and get the credits back, right? So you, you have some sort of a um, mechanism for reclaiming something that you're not gonna use, but with those, um, with those systems, uh, sometimes it's not possible. So in, in this particular case, what they did was that they have a very interesting idea because um, they wanted the system to be um, decentralized in such a way that those tokens kind of work like those paper tickets, right? Um, so if I go to a kiosk and I buy a Norwegian uh, train ticket as a piece of paper, then I get the paper and then nobody cares what happens, right? I, I can give it to Lama and then she goes on the train and then if the conductor checks, she shows and it's like, yeah, it's a valid ticket and she can travel, right? But nobody cares what happens to this piece of paper. It's completely decentralized, right? Um, so they wanted similar system uh, and they wanted the similar system to be done with smart cards. So what they did, they kind of have a kind of a hardware-based security model built into smart cards in, in, in Java actually. Uh, and it was representing those tickets, those kind of uh, um, tokens for travel and for food as, as uh, cryptographic uh, entities on the smart card. And then I could go to Lama and I could transfer my ones to, to her one, right? So I could transfer some of my tokens to her card and then she could use them. So people could kind of uh, do uh, an easy top up, an easy transfer of those, of those tokens. And that kind of created a, a really uh, decentralized kind of cryptocurrency uh, before Bitcoin, <laughs> because that is like early 2000s, right? So they, they had the system working like in 2004, 2006 um, before Bitcoin happened, right? And it was managed by the transport authority, but it was kind of completely decentralized. And with those smart cards, it was completely mobile because the smart card didn't need to talk to a central server. It, it had all the tokens and all the information locally, and you can kind of interact without accessing a network. So I could kind of uh, transfer it to her or transfer it to a merchant who is giving me food, like without talking to the central server, right? And that, will, that is the idea here. The idea is about systems that don't need to talk to central server for, for things, right? Um, in the context of, the, of this Hong Kong experiment, uh, of course, you have to have a clearing house, right? So at, at some point, um, so you have a, a system like this that you have, uh, you have those decentralized people. Uh, some of them, some of them, um, okay, so how I do that? So this is a train, right? And then some of them have uh, food uh, and some of them are just people using the, the transportation or, uh, or the food from, uh, from restaurants, right? So we kind of exchange stuff here. We do this, but you have to have uh, two mechanisms. So one mechanism is you have to have some sort of a bank that uh, a person can say, I want to exchange my, uh, my physical money uh, into those, uh, let's say tokens, right? Uh, and then here we exchange all those tokens. Uh, and then the merchant at some point has to say, okay, I earned money, right? I earned like this guy, which serves the food. He says, or she says, I now have some tokens, but I have to pay my rent. And the rent guy doesn't take the tokens that the rent guy won't knock, right? So then they have to go here and exchange tokens 
or not, right? So that this kind of a bank was the uh, transportation authority in, in, in the case of Telcom, right? They were the ones which were kind of on the boundary of the system. The system was completely decentralized and they kind of uh, could do various things here in this kind of uh, setup. But on the boundary, you had this, right? So um, this, of course, goes outside of the scope, right? How, how, how this boundary happens, you cannot completely do it in a decentralized way because you have to interface the, the fiat currencies somehow, right? Uh, but this can happen in a completely decentralized way without the central servers or be, be, without this kind of a central authority. So that's the topic number two, right? And I will put the link to this uh, Hong Kong uh, currency here. So then the third one is uh, decisions. We covered that last lecture. So we talked about uh, ways of making decisions and uh, fairness and uh, how we can achieve consensus. Um, so this is uh, relatively well-defined. Um, the fourth topic is about incentive systems. So what, what is that? Um, well, uh, if you, um, if you, yeah, I, so if you have, um, if you have system like this, okay, so you have some uh, mechanisms that allow you to do this. And one of those mechanisms, for example, is Bitcoin, right? So uh, Bitcoin is kind of a token system which allows you to do this. And then you have to have some mechanisms which prevent people to cheat, right? So you have to have some agreements on how to make sure that people don't cheat. Uh, so there is, um, you know, in Bitcoin you have proof of work. And proof of work is a mechanism which allows uh, miners to in, like spend electricity and sp spend computing power on generating consensus. And they are kind of rewarded uh, in, um, in Bitcoin, right? So there is a financial reward. Um, there is a financial reward for them for doing their job. And if they try to cheat and if they jeopardize the system, there is a financial punishment for the value of Bitcoin going down or for the system to collapsing such that the investment in electricity or, um, you know, or, or, or computational effort that they've made is kind of lost, right? So the incentive is kind of based on financial, uh, financial system. So proof of work is kind of linked to financial um, incentives. Proof of stake uh, is another mechanism for achieving consensus and uh, proof of stake. And of course, that one is also based on financial stake, right? So you have certain amount of uh, financial stake in the system such that if you are proven to be cheating, then you are losing the stake, right? More or less. Uh, there is another popular one, which is a uh, proof of uh, storage. Uh, so let's say storage. So you, instead of putting money or instead of computing, you're saying I have those disks, those SSD disks, they are available for the network. And then you kind of can demonstrate that you have them available for the network. And again, but that is, you know, that boils down to finance as well. Like someone needs to buy those disks, right? Uh, so here you have kind of a financial stakes and here you have uh, financial incentives as well. So topic number four is, can we do something different that doesn't use financial incentives? Can people be motivated to do something uh, or to not act uh, selfishly or not to be cheating because of something else than finance, right? Something else than money, right? Um, one mechanism is which Facebook cleverly pushed, like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if you remember early days of Facebook, like you could have anonymous IDs, right? You could have pseudonyms uh, and then they, introduce the new rules of the service and say, everybody must use a real name, right? Why they did that? Yeah, first they needed the data. It's much easier to track people if they have to say their real name, of course. 
that's aligned with their business model. Uh, what else? What was the second reason? So uh, are you participating in uh, any of the forums of or, or social networks that don't enforce real names that they are using uh, pseudonyms? Yeah, but Ben is, so what happens there? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> very, very good summary, right? You have trolling, right? You have a lot of abuse, right, in the system. It's kind of really hard to control that, right? They are, but it's easier to control it, right? Yes, especially if originally you linked up with your real name and your real identity, then you have this kind of, um, you know, reputation. A reputation is one uh, which is linked to your kind of name and you kind of don't to be acting like a dick if your real name is on the left, right? Uh, you, you try to control yourself. If it's a pseudonym, like, and you can create pseudonyms at, at will, sure right uh you can abuse the system so reputation is one of those kind of incentive mechanisms which can be used to try to make people act the way you know that enforces some good rules right yeah ben exactly Yeah, exactly. So they, th those are all mechanisms to sort of benefit from reputation being a currency, right? Um, you don't want to jeopardize your reputation. Sa same, for example, in uh, Stack Overflow, right? Uh, Stack Overflow is a, is a system which uses pseudonyms. Uh, you can create a random chat there, but you have a very strict hierarchy and you're building up your reputation by contributing to the system in a proper way, which the system is designed for, right? So then the abuse, um, so in Stack Overflow, you don't link your real identity to Stack Overflow, people don't care. Uh, I mean, the, the uh, owners of the system don't care. It's good for you actually to link it to your real identity because usually you can demonstrate to your employer or whoever that you are kind of a good contributor, right? And then you have a hierarchy such that on, on level zero, you cannot do much. And then as you're climbing up with your reputation, you can be kind of um, given more and more permissions to do things in the system, right? So the reputation is the kind of incentive mechanism for uh, building up your capabilities to participate. Yeah, Ben? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Yeah. So how is it called? How is that problem called? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so th this particular problem is called uh, nothing, nothing at stake. So in nothing at stake situation, there is a system, but because I can create a new account again, I haven't lost anything, right? So if, if I don't lost anything by creating a new account, then I have nothing at stake, right? In uh, Stack Overflow, they solve the nothing at stake problem because if I already build a little bit and I create a new account, I have to start from scratch. I have to start from zero to get to here, right? And this level cannot do a lot of abuse, right? If I'm a troll and I want to kind of, uh, you know, uh, mess up the system, uh, it's much easier for me to mess up the system if I'm kind of higher up in the hierarchy than if I'm at, at zero, right? 
So I have something at stake if I um, if I lose that, right? Um, anyway, I think I you're getting the point, right? So the topic four is for all those non-financial incentives and for mechanisms of kind of enforcing behavior uh, the way that the system is designed for uh, and the interplay between those different mechanisms because you can have a combination of different ones. You can have a combination of non-financial ones with financial ones, for example. Um, the, uh, the whole field is a trade-off, is a balance, right? Um, like the, 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 the societies work by keeping that balance, right? There is always uh, benefits of doing wrong things. And there are kind of uh, punishments or kind of a price that you have to pay if, if you get caught, right? Um, so the, the criminals, they are kind of working on that side of the equation. They, they, they are benefiting from, from uh, the inability for the system to keep that balance perfectly fine, right? If, or the, the balance is perfectly fine, so it kind of doesn't matter on which side you are on because you're kind of getting the same value for the same risk, right? Um, so it's um, it's a trade-off. So, so what, what we try to achieve in, in, in society is we try to achieve a, a certain level of behavior and certain level of collaboration that everybody on average is better off, right? But of course you have fluctuations and me, uh, you know, uh, maintaining that everybody is better off means some people could be even better off if they cheated, right? Um, so th this is about that. Uh, GPT-3, yes, that's kind of a hot topic. I honestly don't know much about it. Like um, I'm looking forward for the lecture. <laughs> so someone who can kind of uh, uh, tell me more about it. I know it's a very impactful technology. Um, the idea is that you can train um, kind of a very big, robust uh, natural language processing model to be a, a, a very good AI, uh, such that it can generate text which is indistinguishable if the text was generated by humans, right? Um, and that has kind of a lot of impact on a, a, a lot of fields, especially kind of a social networking, because uh, currently, Let's say, uh, let's say one European country wants to do a referendum where they want to vote whether they will be in or out of EU, right? And I'm a kind of a, a, a state which wants to disrupt the process and I am kind of uh, happy to mess, mess the whole thing up, right? So what I do is I kind of uh, create bots and I create some sort of influencers, uh, you know, programmatically and also with some humans. Uh, to kind of uh, swing the public opinion a certain way through Facebook or Twitter, right? Uh, fake accounts. Um, but it's a lot of work, right? So, and also it's kind of um, easily detectable that those bots are kind of doing certain things, right? They are kind of dumb, right? But if you use GPT-3, they can write kind of a, a, a good looking text. They can write kind of a convincing arguments. Uh, and then the battle becomes like the battle between humans and the bots becomes kind of uh, uneven, right? Because bots are really cheap to produce. You can have, uh, you know, thousands of bots participating in a debate and then the humans are kind of limited, right? So if you're kind of on Facebook and you suddenly in get into a discussion with, you know, thousand bots, <laughs> you're kind of screwed, right? Um, so the, there is, uh, some people say, yeah, there is a kind of a big risk with this type of technology because it will uh, be used for generating fake news and it will be used to swinging public opinions on social media and, and so on and so forth. Um, so at which level you will tackle that uh, doesn't matter. As I said, we can have more than one person dealing with this. One person can deal with the technology, how it actually works and one can work with the impact it may have on social media and, 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 and so on. So, uh, yeah. All right, federated learning. Um, this is a topic which uh, is um, becoming more and more popular uh, due to privacy laws and uh, privacy regulations. So um, in a lot of cases, uh, you have a situation where by law, you cannot ch exchange data, right? So for example, um, one typical example is hospitals and um, cancer research or some, some rare disease research. Uh, so for example, you have, um, you have a hospital. Um, 
we have a hospital and the hospital has um, deals with a particular rare disease. Uh, and let's say there is, a, I don't know, a, a very small percentage of people who has that disease. So let's say this uh, hospital deals with 1 million patients and then they have uh, 50 cases of that disease, right? So they, they kind of have data about 50 people, right? Uh, and then you have uh, multiple hospitals like this, um, but they cannot really share the data. Uh, they're due to privacy laws and due to uh, jurisdictional uh, regulations and so on. Maybe they cannot share the data, right? But if I have, you know, if I have now 1 million of those hospitals, then I have 50 million uh, data points, right? So with this, I can do a lot of research. Uh, I can train AI models and I can do some stuff. With 50, uh, I cannot do much, right? Uh, so how can we merge all those things to form this data set in such a way that I can uh, do some AI with it or some machine learning or some building a model, right? A predictive model. So, well, we have this federated learning, right? So federated learning is that instead of uh, doing ML on this data set, which is just one giant data set, you're kind of doing ML on those independently and then combining the results into a single model such that you have this sort of equivalent of the, of the big, big model, right? Um, and that technology is, it sort of uh, started uh, in the last you know, 10 years. It's, it, it's kind of a new, relatively new. Uh, and, and it has certain uh, technology limitations and also certain um, privacy limitations such that uh, because to build this common model, I have to combine the individual, um, individual data processing results together. And then when I'm doing this com combining together, there is a certain privacy leakage. There might be some privacy information leakage which happens. Uh, so there is kind of a ongoing uh, research on um, what are the privacy considerations, what are the technical limitations. Uh, some algorithms which are done like this way take a long time. And then if they are done this way, they may take even longer. Uh, sometimes it's faster. Sometimes it's more effective to kind of distribute it because those can be done in parallel, right? Um, so th this is kind of an interesting, um, in interesting uh, topic for um, from privacy and uh, decentralization perspective as well. Okay, so then we have uh, topic number seven. Uh, I will actually have a meeting today uh, with the tax representatives, which are very interested to know what should be done or what can be done in terms of uh, decentralized systems. Uh, tracking and uh, regulatory compliance, because it, it is kind of a hard topic. Uh, so there is a, uh, a lot of um, discussions of how taxes should work. Uh, some, some jurisdictions uh, don't tax, for example, crypto to crypto. They only tax when you um, kind of uh, realize the, uh, the gains. So like if, if I'm an investor, normally, uh, so if I, I have some capital uh, and I buy some sort of financial instrument, so let's say I, I, I bought some, uh, I created some sort of uh, investment portfolio. So I, I have some uh, investment portfolio, right? Um, and then this portfolio will perform. I will have capital gains or I will have losses or something will happen, right? So then at the end of the year, I kind of uh, get the report and I say, uh, what's the difference of what was in, right? What I put in and what I got out. And the difference is kind of taxable, right? That's what kind of I, I do uh, with normal investments. But with crypto, if I bought crypto, uh, right? So I bought some crypto. Uh, and then I change this crypto to a different crypto. Is it? Is that point a uh, realization of the, of the gains or is it still part of my portfolio? And only when I change it back to, uh, to dollars or to Norwegian krona, then I sort of realized my, uh, my profits, right? So questions like this, like how, 
how different countries do this, how different countries tax crypto, and how that changed from like you know five years ago to today, and what are the uh, the trends of uh, taxation. Uh, so if you're into taxes, that's the topic for you. Um, I had a topic um, uh, two years ago or three years ago uh, with a student, uh, and we were uh, we were dealing with uh, zero knowledge proofs actually. So zero knowledge proofs plus tax. And the idea was that, um, yeah, it, it didn't. <laughs> uh, the idea was that uh, when you uh, prepare your tax return, um, the tax office needs to get all the data from all the banks to, to, to check, to verify what you've calculated. and and they kind of do the same calculation again, right? They do calculate your tax and check if your declaration match. If they don't match, they investigate why it doesn't match. If it matches, then you pay your tax, right? Um, they, uh, in Norway, for example, they do the calculation automatically unless you're doing something unusual and then you don't even need to do your own declaration, right? You just need to confirm that what they've done is correct, right? Uh, if they, if they don't know about something you're doing, you have to declare it, right? Um, so the idea was, can it, can it be done in such a way that this calculation, so if you have the tax office uh, is here, uh, all the banks, um, all the banks and kind of a financial reporting and your employer data and so on, it, it all goes here, right? So banks, um, your employer, data and, and so on kind of goes here. And then you are here and you have some records of what you've been doing, which they may not know about, right? Uh, so then you kind of calculate that because you have all of that as well, right? Uh, you have all of this plus some things which are not in the system, right? So now what you have to do is you have to tell them about those uh, extra things and the calculations are done by them. Right. So what we were trying to do is to turn that around and say, no, 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 let's do this. Let's um, let's not send them all the data. Um, let's keep all the data with the person. The person knows everything because that's how it is. The person does the calculation and sends the calculation results to the tax office. And the tax office checks the calculations mm -hmm. by doing some knowledge, uh, uh, zero knowledge proofs against what has been declared, right? So you don't do the calculations here and the tax office doesn't have all the data. They only have what's needed for them to confirm that this calculation is correct. So they don't learn about your every transaction, all the, dodgy stuff you bought online and stuff like this you know that but when you do your calculations this is confirmed using zero knowledge proofs with all the data providers such that they know the c is correct and then they tax you accordingly right um so this is the kind of the ideal situation for us because then our transactions our private life is not shared with anybody uh, and for them because they don't need all this data and all this processing, right? It, it is just a confirmation that the calculation was done correctly, right? They would like to op outsource all of that uh, because that is a lot of work. Um, so if this can be done in kind of a privacy preserving user centric way, it's a win-win for everybody, right? Uh, so we had a project which was kind of investigating if we can kind of achieve that. Um, and in theory, yes, in theory, you can achieve that. In practice, it's much more complicated. There is a lot of issues. And what we've focused on in the master project was uh, to demonstrate what can be done and where are the kind of the um, enablers and whether the inhibitors, the, the, the things that prohibit that to happen. And one of the uh, prohibitors was the uh, inability to do certain calculations in zero knowledge proof way. Uh, because the libraries don't support it. So certain things are theoretically possible, but are very impractical, right? So you can, in theory, do certain operations, but they can take practically, you know, thousands of years. So they are kind of not 
feasible yet, right? We need to find methods which would make that feasible. So we're kind of identifying what is possible today and what is not yet possible. And then uh, the existence of a very robust, for example, floating point operations on numbers using zero knowledge proofs is one of those uh, prohibiting factors, right? Operations on, um, on natural numbers is okay uh, on, uh, on integers, but operations on floating point numbers is, a, is not solved problem yet. And for some tax calculations and for some things, you do need to have floating numbers. Uh, you, uh, you need to do certain roundings and you do need to do certain uh, floating point operations. I mean, you, most of the time you can represent uh, currencies up to, certain, up to arbitrary level of precision as integers uh, and do everything on integers. But for some operations, especially for, uh, um, yeah, anyway, you, you get the idea, right? So this, this topic can be sort of a shape a little bit, not how people do taxation for cryptocurrencies. It can be done for a little bit, you know, different uh, avenue. All right, and then we have, um, how are we doing with time? Yeah, so I can finish the topics. So the, the uh, second last is um, decentralized finance in general. Um, and that kind of, um, that's again, a very novel, very uh, new uh, topic uh, that has started in the last, you know, five or so years. Um, and it is uh, exploding uh, because of the technological innovations and some of the, uh, some of the possibilities that blockchains and smart contracts offer. Uh, so I kind of listed uh, some, I listed uh, Ethereum and Polkadot as two chains that are kind of uh, the, the most important ones. Uh, and for example, both of them, Ethereum and Polkadot allow you to have smart contracts which allow you to have decentralized exchange of one crypto with another one, right? So the, the decentralized exchange idea is that you have two people, um, you have two people and they have certain asset. So this person has asset one, this person has asset two, uh, and they want to exchange the assets, right? Uh, in the normal life, what happens is you have a trusted intermediary. So you have some sort of intermediary which uh, works as a, uh, so we have trusted, uh, trusted intermediary. Let's say one person has money, another person has a house. So what happens? Well, you go to the lawyer, uh, which is the trusted intermediary, and you say, I want to sell the house, I want to buy the house. Here is my money, here is the deed that I own the house. This guy checks everything, or this girl, uh, and then, you know, the transaction happens, right? So that the, the exchange happens through the trusted intermediary, right? Um, this person has um, Norwegian krona, this, that person has US dollars. They want to exchange what they do. They go to an exchange or to a bank and they say, yeah, I want to exchange US dollars for Norwegian krona and that happens, right? So the idea with the decentralized exchange is that you don't need that. You can do the exchange yourself in a trusted non-revocable way, right? Uh, so the idea is that there is kind of something, uh, some sort of trust generated service that allows the exchange of assets in such a way that neither of those people can cheat, right? So the exchange either happens or the exchange doesn't happen. And then it is not possible to have a situation because what you want is from situation, from the initial situation zero, you want to get to the situation one, which is uh, that person has a two and that person has a one, right? So you want to transition from here to here, right? And then a situation that this person has a one and a two at the same time, or this person has a two and a one at the same time is impossible, right? So I should not have a situation where uh, I'm buying a house, I got the keys, I got the signed documents and I haven't transferred the money. And I, I mean, with the house, yeah, it's like easy to solve, right? Uh, because, yeah, but th there are situations where um, you, 
don't want the person with the goods and with the money to be together at the same time, right? You want the, the exchange to be atomic, right? Um, so there are this kind of, um, this is possible with some of the um, blockchain and smart contract technology, such that you don't need this uh, uh, trusted intermediary. What else can you do? Well, for example, you, um, you want to buy a TV and you don't have money today, but you are earning money and you will uh, want to borrow money and then pay over the next 12 months, right? So you have, um, you are here, you want to buy TV today, uh, and then over the next 12 months, uh, you will be paying back some things, um, but you kind of need the money today. So what happens is you have a bank, uh, the bank takes money from everybody who keeps the money in the bank, and the bank says, well, you know, we have all those people, uh, 30,000 NTMU people who are, whose money we have. How likely is it that all of them will need all their money at the same time over the next 12 months, right? They say, well, it's kind of such and such unlikely, right? So we have some money in the, in the bank, which we can give and then get back in the next 12 months, right? So the bank kind of gives the loan on our money that we keep in the bank to somebody to buy the TV and they pay them back, right? And then this system kind of works, but as we've seen in uh, 2008, some banks kind of give out too much money that they don't have the, you know, in, in the vault, such that you end up with a financial crisis and then the government needs to buy them back and blah, 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 right? So you have, this is kind of the normal model. Uh, with decentralized finals, what you can do is you can say, okay, all those people, have some money, right? All of those guys or girls have money, which they don't use today. So now we can say, okay, Mariusz, uh, are you gonna use uh, your money in the next 12 months? And I say, actually not. I, I am happy to lock it for 12 months uh, in the lock, in the locker, uh, such that I promise I'm not gonna use those money. And in fact, if I lock them in this locker, I will not be able to get them out. I, I can get them out after 12 months, right? In return, I want, I don't know, 5% or 10% or 15% extra, right? Um, so then I kind of lock part of my money in this lock. I have a certain contract which pays me back premium. And then if you combine this together, you have kind of a money available for somebody to buy a TV and they promise to pay a certain they, they promise to pay the installments plus a certain percentage back, like with the normal bank, right? And you can do that using smart contracts and using decentralized finance without the bank. And I have a guarantee that my money will not disappear. And these people have the funds available for them for kind of a social borrowing, right? Um, how you deal with trust and how you deal with the assurance that they will pay back, that's a separate issue, right? Uh, you can kind of, do that in different ways. Uh, and uh, you can, um, that goes back to those incentives that people don't cheat. It goes back to reputation and, and so on, right? Because there is, uh, there is a certain risk as well for me, right? So if I lock my money, I may have a certain risk of uh, that person not paying back. And then I may have a certain risk of losing money, right? Um, it depends how you set that, that up. So social borrowing, uh, decentralized exchange and social insurance. Those are kind of a typical use cases that are used in uh, decentralized finance, but you can do other things. And the question here is like, how it works? What can you do? What can you do beyond kind of decentralized exchanges uh, and what you can build with this, with this technology, right? Um, again, the topic can be dealt on kind of how the smart contracts work and how it op it's operationalized. It can be about those incentives and assurances, how you deal with that, or it can be with the kind of a high level governance or, or services that are built on top. And that leads me to the last topic, which is data governance. Uh, so what it is, how we normally deal with that as uh, institutions or society, and how, what is changed because we have these new technologies, right? So one example is I, I, was, um, I was on a, a PhD defense yesterday and uh, there is a, I, I will post the, 
uh, I will post his uh, trial lecture because his trial lecture was about data governance. Uh, and uh, in, in the lecture, he looks at it from the organizational and kind of a management perspective. And on one of the slides, slides he says that uh, data governance cannot be solved by technology. And that was true until today, until recently. Uh, data governance was not able to be solved by technology, but with smart contracts and with blockchain technology, you can enforce certain governance uh, provisions through the technology, right? And you don't need a human in the loop. Uh, so of course, the design of what the go data governance is has to be designed and kind of implemented by humans, but the enforcement and the actual way of how it works can be completely automated. Um, so this is kind of a more, um, more researchy topic, which is from the uh, borderline between the technology and kind of a management, uh, how, how we deal with it as institutions and, uh, and how the technology, how the smart contracts and uh, blockchain is changing the, the landscape. So those are kind of the quick overview of the, of the various topics. Feel free to use them as a kind of a starting point, but kind of a modified to what you are interested in and what you want to do. Uh, and then if you have a topic that doesn't fit any of those, uh, you can propose your own as, um, as Ben suggested. Okay, so I went a little bit over time. Do you have any questions? If you have no questions, then uh, what's next? Um, you basically click on the topic that is closest to you, like I, I did here. Uh, it will say, oh, do you want, uh, okay, so I will click on the one which I haven't clicked before. So let's say uh, this one, it will say, do you want to create a page? Yes, you do. And then you start by uh, setting up the title, mobile blockchains. And then the important thing is that you say, who are you, right? So who will be the, the lead for that topic? And you put your name, put your name here. And then you save it. Uh, you create a page and then it will show up. Um, yeah, sorry. Go, 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 cancel. I don't want, I don't want to click on it uh, because I don't want to have topics which are not taken. <laughs> Right, so I only want topics that are taken and I only click on SSI because I knew there will be an SSI topic. Uh, so uh, click on the, on the ones that you want to take, then they will appear here. Uh, all the other ones which are not taken, I will put auxiliary topics and then we will kind of end up with the list of the topics that are kind of being worked on. And then um, we will kind of uh, formalize and provide more details on what exactly the, the, the lecture and the topic is. Um, so is it clear? Yep, perfect. And once this is done, once we have this list sorted and this topics which are, we are not doing sorted, then I will do a table with time and then we can kind of fill up which topics are when, and then you will know when you will have to prepare it. And as I said, uh, we are aiming at about an hour. Uh, can be longer, can be shorter. I know Ben's lecture will be longer for sure. <laughs> we know that it's okay. Uh, some people talk less, some people talk more, no problem. Uh, we can accommodate that. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's all about the topic. So I will uh, pause the recording and we will have a 10 minutes break. Resume recording. All right, so um, I gave you a puzzle and the purpose of the puzzle was to kind of uh, get you refreshed with some of the probability theory <laughs> because it's kind of useful for the topic of zero knowledge groups, right? So the topic was a bit more heavy. It was kind of uh, with the logarithms and with uh, a little bit of uh, you know linear transformations of the kind of uh, logarithm spaces. So, um, the, the puzzle was uh, that you have a situation where you have people lined out um, in, a, in a sequence, in a queue, um, and then they look this way uh, and they can only see this way, right? Um, 
so so Lama sent me a, a possible solution. Uh, did any of you send me a, another solution that I haven't noticed? <laughs> okay, that's not good. <laughs> so you should uh, you should send me something. Um, yep. You knew the answer. Yeah. Okay. That's good. <laughs> All right, so I, I will, uh, because I'm recording, I, I don't want you, to, or unless you want to explain it on the recording. You want to explain your solution? Yeah, perfect. Sorry? No, no, no. So my solution was that if each one of these counted how many, like, let's say, green plants or red hat in front of him or her, and counted the higher number of hats with like if uh, if this so or this so more green hats than red hats then the probability of having a red, green hat is more than the probability of having a red hat so the probability for the overall uh, survival would be higher with this so we they're counting the majority and yeah. they're using the majority so the yeah. the, the last one uh, is the the hat and counts them and then it tells the others that the one in front, which one is the higher number of hats that they, they see. So the probability of the next one getting poetry is now enhanced because that person knows which one is the more uh, more abundant, right? Uh, I was trying to work out the map, but it, it, it is a bit complicated, right? So I, I agree that uh, working out the actual probability would be quite tricky, yeah. So th there is, um, th there are a couple of situations, right? So one situation is that let, let's let's see um, let's simplify it to just uh, four people. Okay. So one situation is that this person says, "I see red more." Right. So then this person, uh, if that person sees uh, <laughs> equal number, they know they have to have the red one to make that one see red more. Right, uh, so if, if this is uh, green and red, and that person said red, that person knows that they have red, right? For, yeah, no, no, that, that, that person said red, uh, so we don't know if that person survived, but we know that this person should said red because that person saw red being more than green, right? So, this, um, so for, for this person, red is more than green right but for this person this person says green is equal to red which means i have to have red for for that person to, to say what that, that person said correct so that person will survive uh, because that person knows what hat they had but for this person to survive they have to say what they think uh, they had is which which messes up this pe this person because now <laughs> you see what I mean yeah yeah exactly so so the rule again works every second turn right uh, exactly so one person cannot say two things and that person tries to say themselves so they will say what they have to say not what the rule is so they will not count the hat so this person counts the cats. This doesn't, that can count because now this one doesn't know <laughs> what to do. So that one counts and so on, right? So you have um, you have uh, 50 like with the original one, but for, for those ones, uh, the chances are less than with the, so, okay. So we had the baseline and the baseline was um, that person. So the last person, says uh, the hat in front, right? Right, so we have this. So that person says the hat in front. So for this one is uh, 50, 50, right? Um, 
So the, the chance of this one surviving is half. This one is one, right? Because that, that one will always survive, right? And this one is half and that one is one, right? So that was the baseline. And then with this modification, instead of saying the head in front, you're saying, what is the largest number of hats in front, right? Uh, but that reduces this probability uh, because we have, as I said, we have a couple of use cases. One use case is uh, this person says, uh, I see red. And then uh, this is green red. So this one is equal. So that person knows. So this is one, right? That person will survive. The second, the second situation is where you have two reds, right? Uh, so this person says, I see more reds. This person see, oh, shit, I see more reds as well. <laughs> so now this person had could be green or red. Uh, and this statement would still be true, right? So that person now doesn't know if they had is green or red, but they know that this person saw more red hats, which also that person see more red hats, right? So what should that person say? Well, it's 50 50 again, right? Uh, because they could say red just to play along with the, with the majority, but they can have green head and that statement will still be true, right? Um, so then it's kind of a 50 50. And then if the sequence is longer, uh, you, may, um, you may have, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. Like you, you basically, the decision, like the, the, this hat doesn't change uh, that person claim, right? So if, if you take that into account, that means the probability for the second one, every second one is a little bit less than with this base case, right? So I, I didn't work out the math, but like if you just follow the arguments, that strategy will be a little bit weaker than this strategy. That strategy will save more people than, than this one. Yeah, then, then the, the majority, yeah. Do you agree? Yeah. <laughs> like, Lana doesn't agree. Yeah, but I'm using this Yeah. There are 10, 15, and this is the last one. Yeah. And because you use more red. Yeah. And like, I need to survive. Ah, yeah, 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 that's right. Yes, that's yeah, right. OK. Everyone that says one of the children that says let's survive, I get it. Yes, I get it. Yeah, we didn't take that into account. So that, that is correct. So what happens is in, in the first scenario, that person said, um, that person said red uh, when these guys were green and red and survived, but that uh, um, that kind of carries two informations, right? So yeah, so one information was what they had, like what hat they had, because that that person will know if they got killed or not. Uh, so that person will know what hat this person had. And with this information and this information, that person can again be in the position of that person deciding like uh, whether they, now this person would have seen if that changed the head. Yeah, so that is um, complicated <laughs> to, uh, to work out the probability. But you, uh, you are right that, um, what is the uh, allow? No, not a lot. Only one thing. So for, for this argument, I still feel um, I'm, I'm not sure now if that one is better than this one or not, but this one will have um, a limited uh, usability if I have kind of a low sequence. Um, and you have um, a long sequence with uh, so if I have, um, 
if I have majority of hats green, right, then this person will will have uh, this person will say I or oh, red. This person will say I see majority red, and there is a large majority of red, uh, and but some are green, right? Uh, then um, so th this person says, let, let's say I have kind of a long sequence of reds, uh, and it's red, 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 and blah, 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 right? And then this person says, uh, okay, um, I see a lot of uh, reds as well in, in, in front of me, and it will not matter if I say green or red for the decision uh, of this person, right? So then this person has half. Uh, <clears throat> and then this person says something, right? Uh, but now this person doesn't doesn't know if like okay so this person will assume this person is trying to save themselves right this this person doesn't say what it, it sees it says what it wants to have on the head right so now only this person counts and nobody else counts anything anymore right everybody's trying to save themselves so now this person says green gets killed and this person says okay uh i still see the majority of red um like okay this this person was red and uh this person was green but said red so that person got eliminated but this green this person now knows that that person had green uh and it's still this statement is still true so there will be kind of a period uh, which, which is the difference between the reds and greens that the green guys will cannot decide they will have half right um, but the half um, they will be less so yes yeah, so i agree so this strategy is better uh, this strategy is better than this because for some of the people you will have half um, for the others um Yeah, the question is how many ones will you have, right? In, in this strategy, I have ones for 50%. In this strategy, um, it depends on the ratio between the red and greens. That is true, yeah. Every answer, the next person knows more. Uh, and the counting happens. Um, yeah, that's a good point. So um, I, what, we would need to work out the math to know that this one is better than this. But it, it, it is, I, I, yeah, I, it, it is possible that this one is better than this. Um, yeah so that yeah and and this person is uh 50 50 right so the first one is always 50 50. we we cannot say it the first person better than 50 50 no matter what we do uh because that person doesn't know about their own head and will never know about their own head right there is no information so that person can only communicate some information to the to the rest um yeah, so but th this is an interesting one. Yeah, I, I agree. So this is kind of an interesting one, and it would require a, a little bit more um, because it kind of depends uh, what is the actual ratio between red and greens of what actually is happening, right? Um, because imagine that there are only green hats and one is red, right? Uh, then for all those people, uh, the probability of saying um, green is better, but one of them will die, right? Because one of them will be wrong, right? Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So uh, yes, it will be, it probably is equal to the, um, the ratio of the, so if, if this person counts the hats and this person says um yeah the color and then everybody uses the the first check <laughs> so if if the check 
if what they see is equality, then they say the one which is missing, right? But if they don't see the equality, they always say the, um, the, the majority color. Then the difference, the, the, the ones which will die is the ones which have the, so if, if I do um, count green, um, yeah, so if that, that person said red, right? So I, I, I have total minus how many green I had. So this, is, this will be the number of people who died, right? Because minus the cases where it actually happens to be the equality. Yeah, it's complicated. Yes, equality cases. Because the equality cases are also saved, right? So if I happen to be in the case where I know majority is red, but I see equality, I know I have to have red, right? But if I don't see equality, yeah, that's, I, I can have a green hat. I mean, uh, you know, I don't know. So it's 50-50 for me, right? Uh, but I will still say red because that's what the rule, like the rule is I have to say red. Uh, so I will die if I'm, uh, I happen to have a green hat. Um, but say it again. Yeah. Yeah, so, so this, this strategy is better than this. Uh, but how many will, like the question is how many will survive? on average, uh, and it would be depending on the ratio, like how many are, because if the ratio is really close, then it will be more frequent that I have the equality and I will have one, right? Because then the person will flip. Uh, if, the, if the ratio is like really lean towards, like, as I said, like mostly green and like, I don't know, it says red. So everybody is red. But there are some green hats, right? Uh, and then, uh, because if the green hats are sprinkled like early on, then these guys don't need that, that to count them, like because like they still know uh, the majority is red, right? They only need to count how many red and green happened such that they can know if the majority is still on their side. So it, it kind of depends on the layout, like how they are lay, light, laying in the line, and also what is the ratio between green and red. Uh, the closer the ratio, the better it is for this method to, to, to survive quickly. Okay, so uh, I think this one is better than this. I don't know exactly what is the formula to calculate how many survivals this method will have. Um, for this one, the, the, the survival rate was uh, 75%, right? Um, so 75% of people will kind of survive, 25 will, that's an expected value. Uh, for this one, we would need to work it out, but this one is better. Um, we can, maybe what we can do is we can calculate for the worst case, uh, what is the possibly worst case, uh, and then uh, that's the lower bound, right? Um, okay, uh, can we do better than that? Yes, we can. <laughs> so, do you want to say uh, what the? Yeah. 
What to say? Yeah. So the, the idea is to have a system that this person, again, counts everybody's uh, heads, but in, in Lama's solution, that, that person was counting red and green and choosing the, the highest number. In this solution, that person only counts red heads. Uh, yeah? Yeah. That's right, yes. That's right. So the, the survival rate here is, uh, uh, yeah, let's say 90, So it depends on how many people we have, right? So it's 100% uh, for everybody apart from the first person. And first person has uh, right? well, the first person survives with 50% and everybody else survives. Um, so that, that person counts red hats and that person says red if the number of red hats is even and it says green if the number of red hats is off, right? So now this person also counts all the hats. So for this person, the, the, the hats can be even. So if this person sees an even uh, red hat, it knows it has to say green because that person said even, right? But if that person sees odd number of red hats, that person says red, right? Uh, and that continues, right? So every person just counts in the front and calculates what that person said, and then say the hat that they have to say, right? Uh, and they will survive. If that person makes a mistake, <laughs> that person will die, but it doesn't affect that person because that person again uh, checks. Uh, but if that person made a mistake, now this person needs to take the mistake into account, right? Uh, otherwise, that person doesn't need to take that mistake into account and just counts the hats in front, right? So this is uh, kind of like a parity, uh, parity based solution. And it's often used for checksums of uh, some codes, right? So if you have kind of uh, large numbers to check if certain things are correct. Uh, sometimes we represent them as binary and then we count um, the number of ones. And if the number of ones is odd, we say zero if the number of ones is even, we say one, and we have one bit kind of a check for some, some things that are possibly correct or incorrect, right? Um, of course, if you do that, uh, then there is a 50% chance of your check to be correct for a wrong thing, right? So we sometimes make it in such a way that we increase that probability to an arbitrary level of precision, right? So if you just represent something as a one bit, uh, then you end up having, um, you know, sort of 50-50 chance of the wrong thing being checked correctly. Uh, but if you increase it, then you can make it, you know, 75%, 99%, 99.99999. .99 and so, you know, if you add enough bits, you have a sat you know, uh, satisfying number of uh, probability that you're happy with the check, that the likelihood of your check saying correct for the wrong thing is very small that you can kind of neglect it, that it should never happen, right? Um, all right, so this is um, this is one puzzle. Um, I will uh, post a, a, a next one uh, for next week uh, over the announcement. And then try to try to think, try to um, solve it uh, yourself. If you already know the solution, then kind of refresh it like uh, like, like you, you did. Uh, it's a kind of a useful uh, tool to um, to have. 
Um, all right, so um, zero knowledge proofs. Um, the main reason why we were dealing with that uh, was for you to understand, um, I will not use the, the, the slide. So uh, was to understand uh, password passwordless uh, logins, right? Um, so any of you kind of uh, want to explain how passwordless logins work? Yeah. Okay. Go go quickly and then you can go. <laughs> yeah, you can do something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. So, um, for password or passwordless uh, logins, it basically looks like this. I have a service, uh, and I have a person. Um, the the service uh, and the person exchange two things. They exchange in public. In public, they exchange two numbers, which is a, a generator and some number Y, right? Um, and those two things can be visible by anybody and they kind of look like a, like a random sequence. And you, it is a random sequence effectively, right? There is no, um, no knowledge hidden inside those two numbers. Um, Okay, thank you. And then the person who wants to prove to S that they are the, the person, they know a secret X and using this logarithm uh, formula, they can demonstrate to S that they know X uh, without ever saying X to anybody, right? So what's the advantage? Well, the advantage is that in the normal logging system, I have to exchange something uh, between the service and the person um, in private. I have to kind of exchange a piece of private information, right? Um, yep. Yeah, you can use a public private key encryption. Um, and that would work as well. And then you would need to exchange the public key, right? Uh, so by exchanging a public key to a service, I can demonstrate that I know kind of the, the private information as well, right? So you could use public private key cryptography to achieve passwordless entries. And we do that with SSH as well, right? Uh, we often don't use logins to SSH, we use a public key certificate, like when uh, when you install an open uh, um, uh, Sky High uh, Open Stack account. Uh, Lars Eric asks me, it doesn't he doesn't ask me anymore what password do you want the initially to have. He asks me, send me your public key, <laughs> right? Uh, and then you can log in using the public key. So it's kind of equivalent, right? Uh, it's it's equivalent kind of uh, mechanism for achieving the same thing. Well, but here we're doing slightly different uh, math and here we're doing slightly different math, right? Um, and the, the beauty is that um, what happens here um, is that um, I have this, um, I have this private key and um if i want um so so th this private key is sort of the 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 source of trust the so source of identity 
And then if I want to have a second service, um, so I have service one and service two, uh, I can, to, to use the same mechanism with, um, with, uh, to use the same mechanism with the service two, I would have to have a separate, um, um yeah a separate private key uh and in here i would have to have kind of x1 uh, kind of a, a, a separate secret right uh that i prove that i know right okay so um we running out of time uh today uh was the was the math too hard like for the password the passwordless logins with the logarithm or you kind of got the idea. The second one was hard with the, uh, with the group theory. Uh, you have to have quite a lot of um, math background to kind of uh, get that. But for the logarithm, was that too hard or was that okay? If, if you had to explain how that worked, would you be able to or you felt it was too much? Okay. Yeah, so that, 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 that's fine. So um, my second question is what use cases and what else can you do beyond the kind of um, passwordless logins to use it for? What do you think for some of the domains that we discussed today, this technology might be useful? Yeah, that's right. So for demonstrating some claims or some uh, some credentials uh, using zero knowledge proofs might be uh, might be good because you don't need to reveal the data. You just reveal that you have the data and then some follow ups. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. So in general, um, the situation is, um, so normally with the kind of authorization or some kind of a claim um, systems, we have uh, some sort of, um, so we have some sort of service, uh, then we have some sort of a trust authority and there is us. And then we have to send a data that is checked with the trust authority, and then that service trusts that um, that the data is is correct, right? Uh, with the uh, zero knowledge proofs, what you can do is you can uh, send a claim uh, for the D, but not the D itself that is confirmed with the trust authority and then the uh, the the check the checker doesn't need to know the actual data right so for example when i'm uh, so the the interesting use case for example is when i'm going through the border control uh, and the border control would need to validate that i have a valid passport but they don't need to know who i am so with zero, zero knowledge proofs I kind of show them the passport, which doesn't tell them anything. It doesn't tell them my name, doesn't tell them kind of anything. And they kind of validate it with the trusted authority. Uh, and then th that proves that I have a, a valid passport, but they haven't learned anything about me, right? Uh, of course, you, you may say, what if I show them a uh, Lama's passport, <laughs> right? The, Lama has a valid passport. How, how do they link it to me, right? Well, the, of course, they would have to do some sort of identity check. Like for example, you would have to have a picture attached to the claim such that they can say, whoever is presenting the claim is the person who owns the claim, right? Uh, and then the picture is sort of a, a secondary mechanism to link, uh, but it's not 
um, they, like they don't need to learn my date of birth or my uh, name or my nationality, right? Uh, so exchanging kind of claims without exchanging data is the, uh, the use case that we will discuss a bit more. Uh, and Abile will have some uh, discussions in the context of um, self-sovereign identity. Uh, and, we, um, and we kind of dive into that a little bit later uh, in, in more details. Okay, do, do you have any questions on uh, the projects and on the topic today? Then I, I suggest we try to have the topics picked by Monday. Uh, and then we, um, I will have an individual meetings and Abile will have some individual meetings with you to kind of uh, narrow down the, the topics and then provide the part, uh, articles for, for each of the topics. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for going over time. <laughs>